All right, welcome to News of the Day. I am Dr. Tom Rafai on behalf of the True Health Initiative, a lifestyle medicine specialist, and it is really my honor to welcome a really lifestyle medicine royalty and pioneer, uh, Dr. Dean Ornish with us, who frankly may not really require an introduction, uh, but as we know, there's a lot of people who are lifestyle medicine curious and uh, true health curious that are coming to this page. Um, I wanna make it uh, very clear some really highlights of uh, Dr. Ornish's background. As a founding uh, president of the Preve uh, Preventive uh, Medicine Research Institute, professor at both University of California's uh, San Diego and San Francisco, he went to a little medical school called Harvard. You know, you're probably not gonna know that uh, school, but nevertheless, uh, trained as I, I understand it at Baylor College in, in terms of uh, residency and has spent 40 years in, in, in both the, the clinic and his research in some of the most um, cutting edge and really breakthrough research that uh, I'm quite sure has uh, not made a lot of people happy in the beginning and maybe still to this day, but growing from here, heart disease reversal, cancer prevention, and even as I understand it, dementia, uh, and a unifying theory that may help us understand how really these aren't all necessarily separate things. Dr. Ornish, it is a pleasure to have you here on News of the Day. Well, thank you. I'm grateful to be here. And by the way, I went to medical school at Baylor College of Medicine and did my, uh, my uh, internal medicine residency at uh, Harvard and the Mass General. Okay, wonderful. Wonderful institutions and, uh, and, and just such a phenomenal background. And there are a couple of really in News of the Day uh, worthy uh, notes. And one of them, of course, is Undo It, a, phen a phenomenal book and, and collaboration with you and your wonderful wife, who I saw give a great presentation at the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. But she's one, awesome, by the way. Oh, my gosh. Yes, yes, she <laughs> is. I mean, that, you know, to, she would probably to take all, all, all of our thunder away if she was here. Next, next interview will have to be with her. Good idea. Uh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And, but what really uh, I think sparked this is, is something that is, is so well-deserved. The US News and World Report Expert Committee has decided again, rightfully so in my opinion, okay, uh, that uh, the Ornish program is number one for heart disease again. And please clarify for us, is it not over a decade? It's, uh, they started rating diets in 2011. And so it's the 10th year they've rated it number one. Okay, a decade straight. Well, that's, that is, that's absolutely news noteworthy. So congratulations on that. Thank um, you. I think it's important to, for uh, watchers to know that it's the US News Report isn't in and of itself providing that as a, an expert committee that they have commissioned. People that are at the upper echelons of understanding lifestyle, uh, medicine, nutrition, metabolic health. Uh, so it's, it's not just in any way, shape or form, a simple you know, commercial identification of a product. So congratulations there. Thank you so much. Can you, can you give us as some of the roots and, 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 and to be honest with you in, in my own world, as a, someone who's recovering from binge eating disorder, who lost my youngest brother, you really identified with me when you, you were honest enough about your own story with depression and maybe just take us through a, an, an overview of that, that path that I think has made you really unique and empathic and how you've integrated love into the uh, uh, into a world of science. It's not soft, it's really serious. If you can give us a little background, that would be great. Yeah, I didn't know that about you. I'd be interested in hearing just a little bit about your struggles and what happened with your brother as well. And then maybe I can integrate that into um, what we're doing. Okay, I, uh, well, you know, for years, uh, my, uh, really is rooted in my father who I, I know was, was never formally diagnosed, but clearly we had uh, binge eating disorder and wonderful surgeon who now is suffering with the throes of his lifestyle related dementia and, and you know, long-term diabetes. But uh, my brother had um, really succumbed to a point where he was almost 400 pounds at his peak. He went through bariatric surgery, you know, bless his soul. We took him, uh, um, as you might know, I mean, I had a, a time I was working with a Pritikin. We took him to the Pritikin Center. We had uh, psychologists, uh, everything I could. I, I lived with him, uh, but at, at one point it just became too much. And along with uh, food, which clearly it seems like he overindulged on one evening and, and it looks like he aspirated while under the influence of some substances, mm. uh, it just wasn't able to uh, to make it. I, I myself had, um, as far as the... Uh, 
as far as the aspiration, uh, uh, the uh, aspiration and, and regurgitation issues, I've had a moment in, in particular that put me on the uh, the brink and and kind of shoved me into a, a direction which I um, had uh, just I need to come out and open about this. And about three years ago, I just came out in the open, and it was an amazingly freeing um, yeah. moment for me. Well, I so appreciate your sharing that because it's really, um, you know, our program and I think lifestyle medicine in general is about treating, you know, the underlying causes of why we get sick, which to a much larger degree than, you know, you and I were both taught in our training is related to our lifestyle choices that we make each day, what we eat, how we respond to stress, how much exercise we get, and how much love and support we have. Um, I got interested in this in a way when I was 19 and was profoundly and suicidally depressed when I was in college. And I learned I could take all the meaning out of life, you know, uh, who cares, nothing matters, why bother, so what, big deal, you know, all those kind of, it was more than just your you know, typical teenage existential uh, angst. It was really, I came about as close to doing that as one can without actually following through. Unfortunately, I didn't. One of my favorite movies every Christmas is watching uh, It's a Wonderful Life, you know, with Jimmy Stewart uh, kind of looking back on what his life, um, you know, would have been had he, uh, you know, or, or anyway, just kind of, or, or a life review and, and that was uh, always touches me deeply. And so um, having come out of that, what I realized is that it's not enough to provide people with information. And by the way, I wrote about that in two of, of my earlier books in the um, Reversing Heart Disease book and a book I wrote called Love and Survival back in 1998, which talked about what I think is the real pandemic is not just you know uh, coronavirus or heart disease or diabetes, but loneliness and depression and isolation. Um, and that study after study has shown that when people are feeling lonely and depressed, they're three to 10 times more likely to get sick and die prematurely than those who have a sense of love and connection and community. And, you know, you and your brother experienced that as one way of dealing with that loneliness and pain is food. You know, to, I've had patients say things like uh, food fills that void or fat coats my nerves and numbs the pain. Or they'll say, I've got 20 friends in this pack of cigarettes and they're always there for me and nobody else is going to take away my 20 friends. What are you going to give me? Or, you know, they uh, use uh, alcohol or opioids. You know, we have this opioid epidemic or other drugs or video games to distract themselves or numb the pain or working all the time is a more socially acceptable way of kind of distracting yourself. And so we've learned, I mean, if clearly if information were enough, nobody would smoke. It's not like people don't know it's bad for them. So we don't, we need to, we have to give people information. It's important, but it's not usually sufficient. But we also need to deal with the underlying causes of why people feel this way. And in part, it's because of the breakdown of the social networks that, you know, 50 or 60 years ago, most people had a, more of a sense of you know, a, uh, you know a, a neighborhood with two or three generations of people who grew up together or an extended family they saw regularly or a, a job that they, they, they'd been at for 10 years or more and felt secure and they got to know their coworkers or, you know, a, a church or a synagogue or a mosque or a club that they would go to regularly. But many people today don't have any of those things. And of course, COVID has only made that worse with the, the isolation. I wrote a, a piece for LinkedIn uh, last year called The Other Side of the Equation, which talked about, yes, we do need to socially distance and wear masks, of course, but also we need to um, find ways of connecting with each other, even if it's only virtually like you and I are doing now. Um, you know, uh, Sheldon Cohen did a study. I don't know how he got this, <laughs> kind of went to volunteer for it, but they dripped cold virus, rhinovirus into people's noses. 100% of them got infected, but not everyone got sick. And they found that those who had uh, six or more social contacts over a two week period defined as either a phone call or a visit from a friend or a Zoom call, didn't have to be physically in person, were 4.2 times less likely to actually get sick than those that had two or fewer social contacts over a two week period, even though they were all 100% were infected. So avoiding the virus is one thing, but how your body uh, interacts with it is the other side of the equation. And we can enhance our immune system by making these lifestyle changes. So um, what we find is that if we, you know, that's why support groups, for example, are, are part of our, our study. Uh, and the support groups are not just helping people stay on the diet, for example, but um, creating a safe environment like you'd find, you know, when you grow up in a, in, a, in a neighborhood with two or three generations of people, they really know you, you know, and they don't just know your, your you know, your, your bio, like you read my nice bio at the beginning or your Facebook profile. They know where you messed up, you know, they know, you know, where you, when you got busted or you broke that window or you got arrested or you got addicted or you had an eating disorder, whatever it happens to be, 
and you know that they know, and they know that you know that they know, and they're still there for you. And there's just something really primal about being fully seen in that way. And so the support groups are really designed around the principle of creating a safe environment where people can let down their emotional defenses and talk openly and authentically about what's really going on in their lives without fear that someone's going to judge them or criticize them or reject them or give them advice on how to fix it or any of those things. And it's incredibly powerful and meaningful. It's the part of the our program that people often have the the most uh, skepticism about love more. I mean, I get the eat well. Yeah, of course you got to eat and uh, exercise. You know, you're really out there doing something and, and uh, yeah, I got to deal with stress, but love more. That sounds so, you know, touchy feely. And, and when it is touchy feely, we are touchy feely creatures. We're creatures of community. That's how we survive as a species by learning how to take care of each other and nurture each other. And so the support group, which is the part that people often have the most skepticism about turns out to be the most meaningful part of the program almost invariably because it meets that deep need. You know, <clears throat> one study that Ann and I wrote about in our book is that the more time you spend on Facebook, the more depressed you are, because it's not an authentic intimacy. It's one that looks like everybody has this perfect life, but you, no one's posting their problems with, you know, depression or eating disorders or whatever it happens to be. Um, but in our support groups, we're encouraging people to really speak their truth and to focus on their feelings, that it's really our feelings that connect us. And it's incredibly meaningful. We have people who were in our study it started in 1985 um, and are still meeting together, you know, like, what is it, 35, 40 years later? And they didn't even like each other that much when they first started. You know, it's just such a profound, deep need. And the other thing that we do is that we're presenting the stress management techniques, not simply as stress management techniques, but they're, they are that, but there's so much more than that. You know, the ancient swamis and rabbis and priests and non, non, monks and nuns and so on, didn't develop these techniques just to manage stress, although they certainly can help you do that. They're really powerful tools for transforming our lives, for quieting down our mind and body to experience more of an inner sense of peace and joy and well-being, and to realize that that's really our natural state most of the time until we disturb it. And that may sound like a, you know, a lot of just you know, semantics or parsing words, but it's really uh, have powerful implications because so much of our culture teaches us that we get our health, we get our happiness, we get our self-esteem, we get our love from outside of ourselves. And once you believe that and set up that view of the world, and you know the whole advertising industry is based on that idea, then however it turns out, then you, you feel worse because until you get it, you feel stressed. If someone else gets it, then you feel really stressed. And even if you get it, it's seductive in the moment, but then it's you know like, well, now what? It's never enough or so what, big deal. You know, and then the process continues. But, these, but at the end of a meditation, for example, when your mind is more quiet, and you're feeling more peaceful to remind yourself, to literally remind yourself that the meditation didn't bring you that sense of peace, that rather it was there already. But, and perhaps the great irony of life, not being mindful of that, we end up running after all these things. If only I had more or whatever, more money, more power, more beauty, more accomplishment, whatever, then I would feel peaceful. Then people would love me. Then I wouldn't feel so isolated, but it works out the opposite. But when you're when you quiet down your mind using meditation or yoga or either you know, secular or prayer or whatever it is, to remind yourself that, that that's our natural state. And so then the question becomes not how can I get what I think I need to be lovable and happy and peaceful, but rather how can I stop disturbing what's already there? And that's something I can do something about because it doesn't require, I mean, if I have to get it from something out there, then everyone who has what I think I need has power over the most meaningful parts of my life. But if it's me, not to blame myself, but to empower myself, I can do something about that. And so there's a long-winded way of saying that for me, why I do this work is it's really a conspiracy of love, you know, because when I decided you know, these are the techniques that helped me rediscover inner sources of peace and joy and love in my own life when I was devoid of that when I was 19. And so that became my life's work is to show people how they can use the experience of suffering and being diagnosed with a chronic disease is certainly one way to do that, to use that experience of suffering as a doorway or as a catalyst for really transforming our lives and rediscovering inner sources of peace and joy and well-being and learning how to love ourselves and love others better. And then the paradox is you can often accomplish even more. And I think my life's a good example of that. And without getting sick or without getting stressed in the, in the process. Absolutely. I, I would love to touch on, on what I uh, know you've had as an experience with the Swami. And I want to just step back and and it's hard to describe it as a silver lining, but get your thoughts regarding something we've seen clearly happen, maybe with those that are on the precipice of really, you never otherwise want to do anything like this. It would, it would seem like 
some a World War II experiment, but in terms of how we've isolated those in uh, nursing homes for their own good and seen the progression of dementia and, and almost people who are have so easily able to be decompensated because that connection with their family, keeping them alive, withdrawing it and watching and, and in a sense, not in a nursing home, but with my own elderly mother after about two and a half months of which she said, I can't take it anymore. I feel like she aged five years and three months we really saw that happen, the withdrawal of connection and people yeah. may not have the wherewithal of someone younger and wouldn't otherwise see it because it can compensate in other ways. Just like a, 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 a beautiful flower just wilt before. Well, that's a, I, I hear you. And, um, you know, first of all, when someone is diagnosed with a chronic condition like a heart or has a heart attack, let's say, there's a, an opportunity, the silver lining, as you put it, uh, for transformation because change is hard. But if you're in enough pain, suddenly the idea of change becomes more appealing. It's like, wow, it may be hard to make all these changes, but boy, I'm hurting so bad. Let me try all this weird stuff. And that to me is part of the value of science and why I spend so much time on, some of my life doing research is because we can redefine what's possible and then it can give people new hope and new choices at a time when they're really open to making changes. And of course, you know, we don't learn how to do these things in our medical training. We learn to kill pain and numb it and bypass it literally and figuratively. And yet, the pain is there as a, as a doorway, not that we look for pain, but sometimes, you know, there it is. But if we can work with people in that sacred moment when they're suffering, then we can help them use that as a doorway and a transformation, as a catalyst for transformation. It's kind of like Leonard Cohen used to sing it to the cracks or where the light comes in, you know. Mm -hmm. but, but when you talk about your mom, you know, I'm, I'm currently in the middle of doing the first randomized trial to see if these same lifestyle changes can reverse the progression of early stage Alzheimer's disease. In the book, the Undo It book that you have there that my wife and I co-authored, we put forth this uh, unifying theory that I was trained, like all doctors, to view heart disease and type 2 diabetes and prostate cancer and dementia as being different diseases, different diagnoses, and different treatments. But what I've come to learn over the years, in the 43 years I've been doing research, is that these same lifestyle changes could reverse and therefore help prevent a wide variety of, of these chronic conditions. Um, and I thought, well, well, why is that? You know, with all this talk about personalized medicine, it was really the same lifestyle changes for all of these conditions. And it kind of hit me in kind of a blinding flash in the obvious that the reason why is that these diseases are not so different from each other, that, you know, um, they share the same underlying biological mechanisms, chronic inflammation, oxidative stress, changes in the microbiome and telomeres and angiogenesis and gene expression and overstimulation of the sympathetic nervous system, changes in immune function and so on. And each one of these mechanisms in turn is directly influenced by what we eat, how we respond to stress, how much exercise we get, and how much love and support we have. Eat well, move more, stress less, love more. Boom, that's it. And so if we look at the love more part of that, and by the way, it helps explain why you often see what are called comorbidities. The same person will be suffering from multiple conditions all at the same time. They'll have high blood pressure, high cholesterol, they'll be overweight, they'll have type 2 diabetes, heart disease, all in the same person. Because again, it's all just variations on the same theme. Now, the isolation that you talked about with your mom, we see that especially so in Alzheimer's patients. It's an inherently isolating disease. They start to like, what was that person's name? And like, where did I leave my keys? Where are my glasses? And so they kind of retreat and don't go out as much because they don't want to embarrass themselves socially when they can't you know, remember someone's name when they meet them. Uh, and then next thing they know, they're sitting in front of a doctor who's saying, I'm sorry, Mr. Jones and Ms. Smith, you have Alzheimer's. There's nothing we can do except maybe slow down the rate at which you get worse, but it's just going to worsen. If you want to do anything, now's the time to do it. Get your affairs in order. And that's it. You know, and uh, you know, there have been uh, 500 drug trials in the last uh, 17 years at a cost of over $15 billion. And, and all of them have failed. There have been no new drugs approved in seven years. There was a last week, Eli Lilly came out with a drug that will probably be a billion dollar drug. And all it does is it slows down the rate at which you get worse by about a third. That's about the best they can do. But I think we're at a place with, and, and so then you start to get in this downward spiral that you talked about with your mom, where you start to think, oh, Jesus, I like, I'm only going to get worse. And you kind of sit in front of the TV and you start to, and, and, the, and this feeling like, oh my God, I'm only going to get worse. And when you lose your memories, you lose everything. That's the most, you know, that's who we are. Um, then you start to get into this vicious cycle and downward spiral where you start to feel helpless and depressed, which makes it even harder to think clearly, which makes it downward spiral even more. And the brain literally just begins to shut down. It's kind of like in that, <clears throat> that scene in 2001 where uh, they start to pull the memory cores out of how the computer and he starts to sing, you know, daisy, daisy. It's kind of like the brain literally shuts down 
as an adaptive response. And yet it turns out those memories are still there. We just lose the connection to them. It's kind of like when we lose the connection to other people, we lose the connection to those memories as well. And so the radical hypothesis of this, of this randomized trial that we're in the middle of now is that, um, you know, where to place with Alzheimer's is very reminiscent of where we were with heart disease 43 years ago when I started doing research on that. In other words, the same biological mechanisms are in play that we've been talking about. The less intensive lifestyle interventions like the mind study and the point of the finger study slow down the rate at which people develop dementia. Just like back then, 40 years ago, the less intensive like American Heart Association diet slowed the rate at which people got worse, but they already still got more clogged over time, just more slowly. Back then we said maybe, you know, ounce of prevention, pound of cure, maybe a much more intensive intervention could actually reverse it. And that's what we found. We found there was some reversal after a month, even more after a year, even more after five years, whereas the randomized control group just kept getting worse and worse. I think we're seeing that now with Alzheimer's too, at least in some cases. And, and um, you know, uh, just putting people in a support group together and giving them a sense of hope, you know, and, and meaning, you know, because they're in a study that whatever they show is going to be important. I can't really talk about the interim results now, but I'm cautiously optimistic that if we can show, whatever we show, I think will be interesting. If we show it does nothing, that'll be important for people to know. But if we can show that we can stop or reverse its progression, that'll give millions of people new hope and new choices. Um, and that's what gets me out of bed every day is knowing them. So you saw that with your mom, when you kind of isolate someone in a nursing home and they lose contact with their friends and family, they just literally start to shut down and in, 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 in a downward spiral. Uh, when people retire and they lose that sense of meaning and how they, you know, define themselves. You know, one of the, that book, uh, Man's Search for Meaning that Victor Frankl did, you know, 50 or 60 years ago, talked about who survived concentration camps in World War II. And it wasn't the strongest or the healthiest, or it was the ones who had the strongest sense of meaning and purpose. I have to survive so that I can, whatever, right. bear witness or write a book or be reunited with my loved ones or whatever. So when I talk to patients, I often say, you know, why are you here? Well, I want to live longer. Well, why do you want to live longer? Why do I want to live longer? No one's ever asked me that before. Doesn't everyone want to live longer? I said, well, actually, no. You know, when I was really depressed, I know a lot of people are just trying to get through the day. You know, you know, um, they, don't, they don't necessarily want to live longer. They don't know if they want to live at all. And so just as I learned I could take all the meaning out of life, I learned that I could imbue my life with meaning by making, by serving other people, by choosing not to do certain things, not to eat certain foods, to be in a monogamous relationship, you know, um, that again, what you gain is so much more than what you give up. Yes. And the bigger the changes, the bigger the benefit and how quickly it can occur because these underlying biological mechanisms are so dynamic. I mean, in the case of heart disease, you know, the chest pain goes away within days to weeks in most people. So for someone who can't walk across the street without getting chest pain or make love with their spouse or play with their kids or go back to work without getting severe engine or chest pain within a few days or a few weeks, they can do all those things. Then they say, well, yeah, I like eating junk food, but not that much because what I gain is so much more than what I give up. And that wonderful film, The Game Changers, you know, for an athlete, just again, showed how uh, your, your athletic performance improves. You know, you become Olympic athletes or NFL champions or your sexual performance improves, you know, things that really matter to people. It's not about preventing something bad from happening or living to be 86 instead of 85, which doesn't really motivate most people. Fear is not a sustainable motivator. That's right. It's sustainable. I mean, for a month or so it is, if someone's found out they have a heart attack, they do pretty much anything for like a month or two, but then they stop because we all know we're going to die. It's just a question of when, but joy and pleasure and love yes. and, and, uh, and, I, and intimacy are really what are sustainable. I have this, this um, leads me to a, a question um, I have, but I, I couldn't uh, agree more in terms of the identification of, of someone's real why. And yet the uh, support, in terms of the support group, a, a question I would have, and by the way, the, in, in the section on, on love is very well described, please go get undo it. That's my wife's brilliance. <laughs> Absolutely. And the, the issue I've seen a lot in my experience is how uh, powerful someone's life partner can be one direction or another. We have the English longitudinal study of aging showing that, you know, whether it's smoking or physical activity or or weight loss, it's a lot better when the life partner is on the same page. And in fact, even better if they both are starting from the same point. It's still good if someone's advanced and the other one wants to start, but it's even particularly pronounced if they're both on the same page. But, but at some point in your career, you also discussed you no know, spectrum and in a sense, the, the idea of identifying a person's levels of readiness for change. They may be ready, some might be ready for all out. You know, they've had the event and they're, they're just all in, please give me something. And we, 
they learn and understand that I'm not depriving, I'm providing myself as you described, and they're willing to go through that process because a little bit of delayed gratification versus uh, you know, certain types of processed foods, which are immediate gratification with a balloon mortgage. But how do you see the effect of the lifestyle change in the particular target affecting positively the, the family? That there's a, almost a, a health virus. Don't get it. Don't get vaccinated against this. By the way, this right. Um, no, I mean we're already interconnected. That's the point, you know. And as I mentioned earlier, when you meditate and you quiet down your mind and body, you begin to rediscover inner sources of peace and joy and love and well-being. But if you take it even further, you get to a, a non-dual place. Uh, in whatever tradition you start in, you know, my teacher uh, Swami Satchidananda used to say, "Truth is one, paths are many." If you take whatever religious or secular or meditation or spiritual path, you end up in this non-dual place that on one level we're separate, you know, you're you and I, me, and we can enjoy having this conversation. But another level, we're already all interconnected. It's like um, he would use the example of you, you know, go into an old style movie theater back when people would go to movie theaters and um, the light goes through the film and then it projects all these dramas on the screen. And, you know, we can enjoy all those different dramas, but it's the same light behind all of it. And so it allows us to kind of directly experience that light, if you will. And when we see how interconnected we already are, then all those spiritual truths really become, oh, well, of course, the kind of logical extensions of that. Like Aldous Huxley, you know, kind of found that the, you find certain truths in all spiritual traditions, love and compassion and altruism and forgiveness and so on. But of course, if, we're, if it's just all us in different forms, then of course that, that makes sense. You know, that anything that brings us together is healing. Even the root, the word healing comes from the root to make whole. Yoga is from the Sanskrit to yoke, to unite, union. These are really old ideas that we're rediscovering. You know, Nicholas Krasakis at Harvard did this wonderful study where he found that if your friends are obese, you're 45% more likely to be obese yourself. If your friends, friends are obese, you're 25% more likely. And if your friends, friends, friends are obese, you're 15% more likely, even if you've never met them. You know, And not just obesity, but depression, pretty much everything, because we're already interconnected. And so anything that brings us together is, is healing. And that's why, for example, the one emotion that's been most strongly and consistently linked with heart disease and heart attacks is chronic anger. Uh, you know, when you're angry at someone, it, it hurts you. When you love and forgive someone, it frees you. It doesn't condone or excuse what the other person's done, but it frees us from that suffering. Absolutely. So I think really being mindful of that, we can see that um, anything that allows us to lead a life of service and love and compassion you know, paradoxically is ultimately the most selfish thing we can do because that's what frees us from our suffering, Therapy. allows us to stay grounded in our own sense of love and compassion. And the more love we have for ourselves, the more love we can give to others. I think the, the quote I remember from Buddha is um, holding on to anger is like uh, drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Or when you point your finger at one person, you have three fingers pointing back at you. Absolutely. Um, you know, some other features of Undo it, I, I really wanted to point out in, in terms of it's uh, such great accessibility, obviously, not just recipes, but you really, you, you, you put phenomenal, easy access nutrition facts there that help define for those that are more numerically oriented. Some are, some are not. The recipes are straightforward. They're easy, but some really like to see the numbers. And there's some motivation for some in terms of uh, information uh, motivation. And, and recognizing in terms of environment, uh, people too, but also, you know, stocking your kitchen for success. The idea that you're going to, uh, uh, you know, uh, just have willpower be the answer uh, and uh, to want to, you know, cut back on things to some 5% uh, fun zone, as I call it, while it's around you 50% of the time is one, you know, step away from Einstein's definition of insanity. You know, it's like bringing the wolf into the house, pretending it's a dog and and then blaming the wolf for, for the wolf biting you. No, it's not. It's that it's an, a beautiful animal meant to be outside, just like Hagen Dazs or whatever else. With all the, <laughs> well, you, you mentioned this earlier that uh, I wrote a book before this called The Spectrum, which was based on the finding in all of our studies that the more you change, the more you improve, and the better you feel, and the more objective measures we can show in a dose response fashion at any age. And so, if you're trying to reverse a life threatening condition like heart disease or type 2 diabetes or early stage prostate cancer and perhaps Alzheimer's, that's the pound of cure. It's really hard to do that. That's why we were the first to prove every study we've done for these four decades, people thought was impossible because um, no one had gone far enough. You know, it's hard to reverse disease. You have to make really big changes. It's essentially a, 
a whole foods plant-based diet that's low in fat and sugar, an hour a day of uh, meditation and yoga, half an hour a day of walking and spending more time with your friends and family. Now that's a lot easier than having your chest cut open and things like that, but it's a commitment. But if you're just trying to lose a few pounds or um, get your cholesterol or blood sugar or blood pressure down a few points, um, it's not all or nothing. The more you change, the more you improve. And you decide how much you want to change to what degree. Then, you know, so like if you came to me and said, you know, I don't have any life-threatening conditions, but I want to lose 10 pounds. I want to get my LDL down 50 points. I say, great, what are you eating now? Well, I'm eating mostly junk foods. Well, in the spectrum, I categorize foods from groups one, the most healthy, which are plant-based, group five, the least healthy, which are your high sugar, high fat, high animal protein foods, and groups two through four in the middle. And said, what matters most is your overall way of eating and living. So if you indulge yourself one day, it doesn't mean you cheated or you failed or you're bad, just eat healthier the next. You don't have time to exercise one day, do a little more the next. You don't have time to meditate for an hour, do it for a minute. Whatever you do, there's a corresponding benefit. You decide, and it's so important because um, even more than being healthy, I think most people want to feel free and in control. And this goes back to the first you know, lifestyle medicine intervention when God said, don't eat the apple, and that didn't go so well. You know, <laughs> That was God talking. So I've learned that if, if I tell somebody, eat this and don't eat that and do this and don't do that, they immediately want to do the opposite. It's not only not helpful, it's actually counterproductive because people don't feel like they're in control. So instead I say, okay, what do you want to accomplish? I want to get my LDL down. Okay, great. How much are you willing to change? Oh, wow, no one's ever asked me that before. They're always telling me what to do. You're asking me how much I want to change? Yeah, how much do you want to change? Oh, I don't know. I'll, I'll eat less of the group five. What are you eating now? I'm eating mostly group four and five unhealthy foods. I'll eat less of those. I'll eat more of the groups one, two, three, but I'll still have some unhealthy foods. Okay, great. How much uh, exercise are you doing? Well, not so much. How much are you willing to do? Oh, oh gosh, no one's ever asked me that. You don't, you're not going to tell me? No, I'm just asking you, how much do you want to do? Oh, I don't know. I'll, I'll walk 20 minutes every other day. Great. How much uh, meditation and yoga are you doing? Uh, zero. How much are you willing to do? Oh, I don't know. I'll meditate 10 minutes a day. Great. How much uh, time do you spend with your friends and family? Uh, not enough, but I'll spend more. Great. So we'll support that. We'll track it. And then a month later, let's say he wanted to get his LDL down 50 points. He came down 30. Say, so, hey, how wonderful. Look how great you're doing. Now, if you just move a little further towards the healthier end of the spectrum, a little more exercise, a little more meditation, a little less junk food and so on, that'll probably get you the rest of the way there. Then they're free. Then they, they were not in this, you know, the whole language of behavioral change has what I call this kind of fascist, you know, moralistic, you know, you're bad. You know, once you call foods good or bad, it's a very small step. I'm a bad person because I eat bad food. Might as well finish a bucket of ice cream at that point, whatever. But if you just say, look, it's just, you know, food is just food. You decide how much you want to change and get rid of the kind of the sense of control. You know, I cheated on my diet, you know, the, all those kind of loaded words and just say, look, you know, this is what's happening. And then it, then it becomes sustainable. And that's why we're showing in our program, and we train now tens of thousands of people. We have data on, on over 15,000 people uh, across the country who have been doing this. So we're getting bigger changes in lifestyle, better clinical outcomes, bigger cost savings and better adherence. You know, it's, Medicare is now covering our program for reversing heart disease uh, in sites around the country, and now even virtually, um, and uh, it's working. Yeah. And uh, that 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 excites me, and and shows. The, and so, for people who have heart, who are listening to this, and who have heart disease, just go to Ornish.com, and you can get a listing of the sites that we have. But send us a note because we'll be offering the program uh, virtually for wherever you live, and you'll be able to get it, and Medicare will reimburse it. Yeah, ornish.com, O-R-N-I-S-H.com. And I can tell you from not only professional, but personal perspective as a, as a binge eater, the, the provision of agency and, and the admission that, you know, I, I'm, I, am, I am DOC, not G-O-D. You know, you are the pilot. <laughs> I'm just the navigator is huge. And it, this, what I call deprivation psychology, uh, it doesn't work, especially aggravated in the emotional eating and, and binge eating, that, that type of restriction, even just psychologically. The idea that um, as I uh, coach patients and, 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 and now clients, that my, one of my first questions right after the why is, what are your non-negotiables? Let's just get them out on the table and, and just state right now. There's no need for the Last Supper syndrome. There's nothing we're going to take away from you. You're a human being with the full right to do whatever you want. I'm going to provide you information and you, you know, you do what you want with it. And it has been remarkably more effective than the prescriptive do as I say. And so often not as I Yeah, say. because then you're not in a manipulative dance and fighting with them all the time or that. And then they'll tell you the truth about what they're doing because, you, you know, in our studies, we've been able to show in every study we've done a dose response correlation between the, the degree of lifestyle change and the degree of improvement. 
And I thought incorrectly that the younger people with less severe disease would do better, but I was wrong. It wasn't how old or how sick they were. It was simply a function of the more they change, the more they improve. And whatever, where we were looking at the amount of blockage in their arteries or the, their PSA levels and prostate cancer, the length of their telomeres, whatever, the more they change, the more they improve. But it's because we're able to get accurate data from them about what they're actually doing or not doing, because we take what we say, look, there's no shame, there's no guilt, That's there's right. no humiliation, just tell us the truth. The worst thing is if you tell us you're making changes and you're not, and then it looks like the changes aren't working because you're not doing them. So it's just a lot of noise. So by removing the, the shame and guilt and all of that, it, it's better research. It's much more likely to get people to make and maintain these changes over long periods of time. And we find, you know, our program is nine weeks long. A year later, 85 to 90% of the people are still following. It. And so um, it's because of the social support they're getting and because of the approach that we're taking. It reminds me too of, uh, there's two things that I brought to mind. One is in terms of the shame. One of the things when I, when I was working, um, I was at the time regional uh, medical director for metabolic health and weight management at Henry Ford Health System. And we stopped the practice of weighing patients as we started to see a lot of them in the afternoons coming in, dehydrating themselves, not eating all day long, being occasionally taking off their wedding bands before weighing in. And I remember that moment, as I said, I'm not part of this part anymore. You, you can weigh yourself, you can weigh here if you want, but you weigh yourself at home or not. And, and, and we trust you, it's okay. I, I really, the last thing is we're trying to help people not, you know, not, not starve and not stuff, but either way, that's the last thing that we wanted to be um, in, involved in as far as uh, that's concerned. So I, I applaud you so much for taking what has been really uh, a rare, now I don't feel so alone by the way, just speaking of you, a, a, a rare approach to the guilt-free, non-judgmental. The information's there. We're going to still provide you that, that information. It's your right to, you want to jump out of a plane parachute like my, my uh, two living brothers, which I have no interest in, in, in skydiving, but that's a risk they're willing to take. They signed the disclaimer then go ahead and enjoy yourself. It's not for me. I jumped out of a plane once when I was in college because I had a fear of heights. And so I thought I'd just go right into it. And it was in Austin. And um, they gave us a, a really in-depth training course for like about an hour, you know. <laughs> right. And the person who jumped before me, their backpack, their, their, their shoe didn't open. They're on the static line, didn't open. So then you have to have the presence of mind to like take off the main shoe, roll over and then pull your reserve shoe. But you're only 2,800 feet high, so you've got like about five seconds to do that in before you, it's too late. And uh, it's actually more dangerous to jump from 2,800 feet than from like 8,000 feet because you don't have much time to react. Anyway, um, so the person before me didn't do that, and I, I thought, I'm not going. They, they literally pushed me off the plane. Um, and fortunately, he had the presence of mind to do that because if you just do the more instinctual thing, which is to pull your reserve chute, it gets tangled up with the main chute, and then you, you die. So... That was my one and only ask. <laughs> I was going to say, I find it a bit ironic. That was the only time that, that you went. And I don't, I don't blame you. The, um, <laughs> the other thought I had in terms of the social support was one of the, the myths that came out of the, the biggest loser study in Kevin Hall. And that the idea was that, um, you know, there was this, this slowed metabolism from the weight loss. That's, that's what the, uh, resulted in the uh, weight regain when really, in fact, Kevin pointed this out himself. It was actually not the factor. What was the factor, although that made the headlines, it really didn't, was how much support they had when they went home was the deter really the strongest determining factor. So this concept of love, of the support that is around you, I cannot uh, um, emphasize enough. The, uh, uh, the, dis the discussion around this has to be uh, thought of in a, in a in serious, no, no pun intended, you know, but loving manner. And I really applaud you uh, for doing that and for providing us of uh, so much of your life's work and time and which we so greatly appreciate today. And you've given us a, a number of, of books and perspectives on do it as being the most recent. And if you're someone that's um, just getting your toe on the water spectrum uh, would be a, a way to certainly uh, do that. We wanna encourage whatever degree you are ready for out there. You are the, you are the uh, pilots, we are just your, your navigator. So if there are any, um, uh, Final thoughts you'd want to give to um, our audience, especially those that might be just you know lifestyle curious. They're they're not um, maybe they're not necessarily uh, ready for all out, but we're planting the seeds. Uh, what message would you like to to leave them with? Well, just this that you know we tend to think of advances in medicine as being really high tech and expensive. You know, a new drug, a new laser, something you know, a new device. And I think our unique contribution has been to use these very 
high-tech, expensive, state-of-the-art scientific measures to prove how powerful these very simple and low-tech and low-cost interventions can be. But you don't have to take my word for it. Just um, try it yourself. You know, say for one day or two days, I'm going to, you know, go on this program. And the paradox also is that you know we're always taught that small gradual changes are easy and big rapid changes are hard, and sometimes that's true. But it's also true that if you make big changes, if you change, you know, begin to eat better and meditate and exercise and spend more time with your loved ones all at the same time, chances are you're going to feel so much better so quickly. It'll reframe the reason for making the changes from fear of dying to joy of living. And that joy is really what's sustainable. And then, then you'll know it yourself. Then you don't have to say, well, this expert says that, and this expert says that, and you know who to believe. It'll come from your own experience, and then you'll know. And then you'll know what your choices are. And then that's what makes it worth doing and then what makes it sustainable. Yeah, you'll probably live longer, but who wants to live longer? Telling so if you told me when I was depressed that I was going to live longer, I'd say, why would I want to live longer? I'm thinking of killing myself. You know, mm -hmm. I'm just trying to get through the day. A lot of people are right on that edge. But if you can say this will improve the quality of your life very quickly within a day or two, and that what you gain is so much more than what you give up, that's what makes it worth doing and that's what makes it sustainable. And as I guess we'll leave it, our, our good friend David Katz likes to say, it's not just uh, adding uh, years to life, it's adding life to years. Exactly. Dr. Dean Orders, thank you so much for your time. It has been an absolute pleasure to have you here on Noted News of the Day for the True Health Initiative. Good luck. Thank you so much, Tom. I so appreciate it. My pleasure. Take care. All right.